Good morning. Before I even do our little welcome announcements, isn't it so beautiful to have all these flowers up here? I walked in this morning and I was like in a meh kind of mood and then I saw all these flowers and I just feel a lot happier now. I mean, then I saw all of you and I feel a lot happier. I mean, I do also, but the, also the flowers are just so pretty. So thank you to everyone who brought them in. Um, I think like a good half of them belong to you, Allie, so thank you specifically. Um, they're really beautiful and I love them, thank you. Okay, now, a couple of announcements before we get properly started. The first one is for those of you who are worshiping here in person, you are invited to make and wear a name tag. You can do that at the table right back there in front of the pride flags. Um, I encourage you to write your name and your pronouns on your name tag. Pronouns affirm gender identities, create safer spaces, and increase feelings of belonging, and that is the kind of space that we believe God is calling us to grow into. Also, you are welcome at any time to go out and um, gaze at the beautiful artwork that Ashley Chambers made for us um, for the season of Easter. And while you're gazing at it, get yourself some coffee or tea or whatever you like. You're welcome to bring that into the sanctuary and um, you can come and go as often as you please to refresh your beverage. As a congregation, we are growing into sacred consent, which means that we believe that all people of any age have agency over their own bodies and so we ask before we touch other people's bodies and we get permission before we share stories or news about other people. Um, Yep, good. Sometimes I have a hard time knowing when to welcome the people online. It, I just get so excited. Hi, Terry. Hi, um, Mark and probably Loisy. Hi, Al and Elaine. Hi, Pat. Hi, Marlene and Carlene. Um, yeah, thanks. Al and Elaine commented and said that the flowers are cheerful. Um, Bill and Evelyn, I bet you guys are, like flowers are popping up all over in Florida, huh? Um, oh, good morning, Gwen, and good morning, April. Okay, great. Now please join me in acknowledging the land and labor that has brought us to this moment in time. We recognize that the land where we worship belongs to God, as does all of creation. We give thanks that God has sustained the many indigenous people with this land over thousands of years, and that even now the creator sustains and abides with those indigenous people who continue to call this place home. We further acknowledge that this sacred space occupies land stolen from the Wimanush Ute people when they were forcibly removed from it. We also recognize that this nation would not exist as it is if it were not for the free and enslaved labor of black and African American people. We acknowledge that our freedom and ability to gather to worship God have come at the cost of black lives stolen by greed, violence, and white supremacy, sometimes in the name of Christ. As we worship, let us honor the Creator's continuing presence in this land and in the labor of our black, brown, and indigenous siblings in Christ. Lament these injustices in our history, confess our complicity in them, and commit ourselves to just and respectful relationships within our congregation, our community, and all of creation. God bless you to whoever sneezed. Please enjoy our welcome statement. God is kaleidoscopic, dynamic, and infinitely diverse, the ground of being itself. Christ is God. The church is the body of Christ. Therefore, the church must be kaleidoscopic, dynamic, and diverse in order to be faithful. In our effort to reflect and embody the expansive beauty and liberating love of God in the world as the body of Christ, we are committed to celebrating and being shaped by people of holy diversity. We commit particularly to celebrate and be shaped by people of all sexual orientations, races, gender identities and gender expressions, ages, socioeconomic statuses, ethnicities, faiths, abilities and disabilities, sizes and national origins. 
we further commit to welcoming and celebrating black, indigenous, and people of color as we strive to create an anti-racist community and work toward racial equity in all areas of our life together. This list is not exhaustive, and we expect and hope it will expand as the Holy Spirit reveals to us those we have not yet perceived. All people are welcome here. However, not all behaviors and words are welcome at American Lutheran Church. We oppose bigotry, hatred, oppression, and injustice in all its forms, and dedicate ourselves and our resources to the ongoing work of God's liberating love and grace-filled justice for all people. We ask God to help and guide us. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Um, spouse, I think our kids are the only little ones running around, but if you want to invite them to sprinkle water, they are welcome. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our life and our salvation. Amen. Amen. People of God, in the baptismal waters, we travel with Christ from death to life. Our past, our sin, our failure, our doubt, our shame are drowned and gone here. You, O oh God, wash us clean. Our fear, our confusion, our self-righteousness, our despair, all are washed away by grace. You, O oh God, wash us clean. Our pride, our hypocrisy, and other people's opinions of us no longer have the power to define us. You, O oh God, give us new life. One moment. The Spirit lives and moves through us, a great and joyful mystery, so we may bring love, mercy, and justice into the world as the body of Christ. You, O oh God, give us new life. Rejoice that God has claimed us in this baptismal grace, not by our own believing or doing, but by God's mercy alone. You, O oh God, give us new life. And so as we begin worship, we give thanks to God for the gracious gift of baptism that joins us together in Christ by the Spirit's power. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. We praise you for the gifts of new life in Jesus Christ. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to assume a posture for singing.
the grace of Jesus Christ, the love, mercy, and justice of God, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, with joy we celebrate the day of Jesus' resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated, and Gertrude, would you come and read Psalm 133 for us, please? Psalm 133, that's a thing. Oh, 133. Can you hear me? Yes, yes they can. Psalm 133, so I'll be reading for today. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred life together in unity, when, oops, when kindred live together in unity, you can tell I haven't read this before, it is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. He ends the reading. I invite the children to come and join me up here for chancel chat. Hopefully, 
spouse. Excellent. Hello, darlings. Hi. Did you take Declan's bracelet? I didn't give it to me. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Aside from one week before your birthday, do you know what today is? No. It's, it's the second Sunday in the season of Easter. Did you know Easter was more than one day long? It is. You did? Yeah? How did you know? You just did? You just remembered? Cool. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, we're still in the season of Easter, and do you remember what we celebrate in the, like, specifically no. in Easter? No. no, you don't remember? Do you remember? Oh, amen. Alleluia. Christ has risen. Christ has risen, that's right. Um, yep, and you both have, I thought I was hilarious for the Easter hunt, and so I made bracelets that said, Christ has riz, because... I'm very cool. Um, weirdly, the middle schoolers did not think that was cool. So <laughs> now my children are wearing them, and they, they don't get it. I feel like that was salt in an open wound. For those of you who are watching online, Cole just yelled out, that's OK. They don't think anything you do is cool. I think he meant like grown-ups in general, but I felt, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so we are celebrating that um, Christ has risen, and there are a couple of different stories about why, like where Jesus showed up after he was crucified and died and then was risen. So you remember last week we talked about how he wasn't where they expected him to be. He was not in the tomb, right? So they went there. They were very surprised he's not there. Um, today, we're going to hear a story about a place that he shows up. And this is what happens in the story, okay? Jesus' friends are all gathered together in a room. And they have the doors locked and, like, all the windows closed and everything. And they're terrified. Do you have any idea why they'd be terrified? No. Okay. They're terrified because... Um, they were like Jesus's closest friends, and the people in their community have just been yelling, crucify Jesus, until he was crucified. And so they're afraid that because they were his closest, some of his closest friends, people are going to be mad at them too and want to hurt them or kill them too. So they're closed up in this room, and they're very scared, and um, no one can get in except then suddenly Jesus appears in the room with them. Isn't that weird? Yeah. But, <laughs> but what? But he was dead. I know, he was dead. And then, remember we talked about, and then he came, and now, then he was alive again. And I don't know about you, but in all of my time being alive, I have never been able to show up in a room that was locked up tight. <laughs> right? Like, unless somebody unlocks it and lets you in, or you unlock it yourself and let you in, I've never been able to do that in my alive body. Have you? Yeah, no, I know. Um, we'd be internet famous if you had. So, how do you think that happened? Yeah, I know, that's really everybody's answer. Uh, nobody knows. We don't know. We have no idea. And then... Um, you can imagine probably that the disciples felt a whole lot of different ways about that. Like some of them were probably like, oh my goodness, that was amazing. And some of them were like, well, what's happening? And maybe some of them, I don't know, thought they were going crazy or something like that, right? But um, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. And then, um, then Jesus showed them his hands and his side because when he was crucified on the cross, they put nails right through his hands. That's how they held him up there. That was one way. And then they took a, a spear and, and like just ripped open his side a little bit. 
Yeah, and so um, he showed them that, and then they rejoiced. Why? Why? Right? That does not feel like the right response, right? <laughs> like when, when Lucy showed you her really beat up thumb from saving that goal in soccer, you weren't like, yeah, woo right? It was wild. Um, Why were they so happy? You know, um, we don't really know. We can just kind of make guesses. If you had to guess, what would you think? Yeah. Maybe, some people think maybe they, he, they were really happy because they got to see Jesus again. They thought he was dead, and then surprise, they got to see him again. Oh, you know, I don't know. I have, I have a lot of thoughts. I'm saving those for the, um, the big sermon. Well, I think that, um, all right, you can, we'll do spoilers. I think that maybe one reason that they rejoiced is that they saw Jesus, and he was someone that they loved, and so they were really happy to get to see him. And also, I think they were shut up in that room because they were super scared, right? And so I think maybe they saw Jesus, and then when Jesus showed them, look, how much the empire hurt me, and I still came back. I still came back for you. Because no matter how much the world hurts me, I will always come back for you. And I think that maybe made them feel really joyful. Empire. Empire. The, there is an empire in Star Wars that is also very bad, huh? Almost always the empire is a word that stands in the place of people who use power in a bad way. Empire. Mm-hmm. So if there was an empire, then he would do bad stuff? Usually empires do some good stuff and some bad stuff and some stuff that's like a little bit fuzzy and you don't really know. One of the things that's really hard in regular life that isn't as hard if you're making like a movie or a TV show is that very few things are all bad or all good. Lots of things are sort of like there are some good things and some bad things. I mean, like, think about candy, right? Like, it tastes really good. Sometimes you need to eat, like, if you're on a run, you sometimes you need to eat candy because you just need that sugar to help you keep going. But also, it does rot out your teeth, and it can give you a tummy ache, and, up your brain. and apparently it squishes up your brain, um, which I hadn't heard before, but I assume you heard that at school, and I probably believe that. So, um, so... It's not all bad, but it's also not all good. And mostly people are like that too, right? Like sometimes you make good choices, sometimes you make bad choices. It's just how it is. It you have a shorter time. Yep. Um, and so sometimes empire does some things that are good, right? Like um, our empire maintains roads so that we can drive on them. That's nice, right? Yeah. That's how we get to go see grandparents and things like that. But also... Um, one part of the empire passes laws that says that transgender people um, can't get the health care that they need to be their real true self. That's very bad. Not all good, not all bad. Um, anyway, this was a really great conversation about empire, but um, my sermon's a little bit long today, so unless there's, you have any other questions, I think we'll just leave this story right here, and we can talk about it in Sunday school more if you want. I know. You ready to pray? Okay, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us so very much. Nothing will keep you from us. Help us to remember you love us when everything feels scary and bad. And give us, courage and give us courage to help others remember, help others remember that, you love them, that you love them, even when everything feels, when everything feels scary, and bad. scary and bad. In Jesus' name we pray. Name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks. It'll shock all of you to know that my children are begging to get out of Sunday school. But it's just us. Do we have to go? Yes. 
All right. I invite you to assume a posture for singing as we welcome the gospel. gospel this morning comes from the book of John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated. All right, so the last time I preached on this story of Jesus' resurrection was the very second sermon that I ever preached as the pastor of American Lutheran Church. I don't know, this story comes up every single year on the second Sunday of Easter, which is jokingly called Associate Pastor Sunday. Because, yeah, because in churches that have multiple pastors, the lead pastor usually preaches on Easter Sunday, and then the associate pastor preaches on the second Sunday in Easter. In churches with me as pastor, this Sunday could jokingly be called Pastor Dan Sunday because he always generously offers to preach on the second Sunday in Easter, and I almost always accept. But this year, we're going off script. Yeah. So I'm going to try to cram absolutely everything I want to say about this story into one sermon in case I don't preach on it again for another five years. Just kidding, probably, maybe, kind of. We'll see. Anyway, there are some things I want you to know about Thomas Didymus. Thomas, who has been called Doubting Thomas, but who was known to Jesus and his other friends as the twin. Now, I just learned this this year. I'm not saying Dan has, Pastor Dan has never said it in a sermon, but I'm just saying I didn't remember it. 
So um, Thomas is from the Hebrew word for twin. So it was probably a nickname, probably like, you know, like how Simon Peter is called Peter. So Thomas was probably not like his given name, but um, it was, so Thomas comes from the Hebrew word for twin, and then Didymus is the Greek word for twin, and so he was called twin twin. <laughs> like kind of it makes him endearing, doesn't it? Twin twin. Um, now, I don't know who Thomas was twins with. The Christian folklore that has grown up around his name claims that Jesus was his twin. But I honestly, I didn't go too far down that path because I'm really interested in other parts of the story and I just didn't want to give time and energy to that. But if you do, I'd love to hear your report back. Okay. First and foremost, I want you to know this about twin twin. He can't believe Jesus Christ is risen. Just like everybody else in the whole entire world throughout all time and all space. I mean, it is, it's crazy. Who could believe it, right? And even if we believe it, we don't know what we believe. What does it mean to be resurrected? Did the resurrected Jesus poop as Leo suggested? How did he have a body that the disciples could touch but also get into a room that was locked up tight? The resurrection and the salvation it affords us is like this really bad resolution photo. We can make some sense of it if we get far enough away from it, but if we peer too closely, it's like a big old mess of the mystical with grainy, unanswered questions, and it's made blurry because it's taken through a lens of a love so big that our brains literally cannot fathom it. So yeah, 20 twin can't believe it. And be honest, neither can I and neither can you at least not in a way you can put your finger on. Get it? Put your finger on? Yeah. Anyway, I'm convinced that the only way to believe in the resurrection is to echo a father from a story that is told in the Gospel of Mark. So in, um, the story goes like this. Jesus, Peter, James, and John have just returned down from the mountain from the transfiguration, and they find the rest of the disciples in town arguing with some scribes. And there's a huge crowd that has gathered around, and they're all watching. Jesus, no doubt, sighing deeply, intervenes and asks what they're arguing about. And this father bravely speaks up and tells Jesus that his son has had a spirit that is causing him tonic-clonic seizures, which is what we used to call grand mal seizures, and that he brought his son to Jesus' disciples and asked them to cast the spirit out, but they could not. The father, surely desperate and disappointed, begs Jesus, if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus responds, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. And the father makes the most profound profession of faith. I believe, help my unbelief. I am convinced that that is the only way to believe in the resurrection. I believe, help my unbelief. Twinny Twin, in his grief and exhaustion, can't quite manage that prayer in response to the other disciples' unbelievable news. But you know what? I don't fault him. Everybody else, all the other disciples, at least all the other man disciples, are shut up in that room in fear. And don't get me wrong, fear seems like a completely reasonable response. The, I mean, like I told the kids, the world hated Jesus Christ with a murderous rage, and these guys were among his biggest supporters. So it only makes sense that those who killed Jesus would want to kill those who loved him, followed him, believed in him, lest the story get out and more people come to believe, follow, and love Jesus too, because then what? 2,000 years later, people would still gather in the name of Jesus Christ to proclaim that the rulers of this world are not really in charge, that the kingdom, the power, and the glory are God's now and forever.
The empire did not want that. Sorry, not sorry. At any rate, the other man disciples were shut up in that room, grieving and regrouping. But here's the thing about grief. It eclipses a lot of things. But basic necessities are not among them. Even in grief, a person must eat and drink and use the restroom. A person must sleep and breathe. So I'm making the assumption that Thomas, afraid and grieving, left that safe space for the market to get what the disciples needed to meet their basic needs. Someone had to. I don't know if that's why he was absent from that room the first time Jesus showed up there, but I think it makes sense. And if Thomas was at the market, his disbelief feels even more justifiable because as I mentioned last week about Mary, Mary, and Salome at the market, I'm sure it was lonely, painful, and terrifying to be among people who had demanded Jesus' murder and who might demand Thomas's death too if they recognized him. And then, instead of showing up with Thomas there, Jesus pops into the safe, secure room where the others were gathered. Maybe Thomas didn't believe because he knew Jesus. And from what he knew of Jesus, he didn't expect the risen Christ to show up with those who were hidden away. Maybe Thomas expected that Jesus' farewell tour would show up in brave spaces or that the risen Christ would confront those who sacrificed him for the sake of religious or imperial approval. Maybe they thought he'd flip over some more things or at least not leave Thomas orphaned and alone in that marketplace. After all, Jesus did say, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. But nope, Thomas did not see Jesus in the marketplace or wherever Thomas went. It was the disciples locked up in their fear and a room that saw Jesus. He entered into that room and their fears and said, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side and they rejoiced. In Koine Greek, which is the Greek that the Bible, um, when the Bible is written in Greek, it's the Greek that the Bible is written in. Rejoice is Cairo. It's a direct cognate of grace, which is charis. And in its most literal sense, Cairo, rejoice, means to experience God's grace and be conscious of it. I didn't know that. To rejoice is most literally to be conscious of experiencing God's grace. When the crucified and risen Christ shows up, those men locked in their fear and a room see the visible wounds his love for the world left and they rejoice. They are conscious of experiencing God's grace. I don't know if it was the first time or the last or the only time that they rejoiced. I do know that they do not rejoice anywhere else in the Gospel of John. It is not written anywhere else in this Gospel that anyone who meets Jesus or hears of him rejoices. It's not written that anyone who meets Jesus or hears of him is conscious of experiencing God's grace until Jesus shows up with his scars. Or maybe they aren't scars yet. Maybe they're still wounds. When Jesus shows up with the violence of empire written on his body, his disciples became conscious of experiencing God's grace. Not when they saw him heal, not when they witnessed him casting out demons, not when he clapped back at haters or flipped tables, not when he prayed or was transfigured, not when he walked on water or fed thousands with a few loaves of bread and a couple fishes, not in his parables or in his silence. When Jesus showed up with the violence of empire written on his body, his disciples became conscious of experiencing God's grace. 
And how on earth do you put that into words? Have you ever been conscious of experiencing God's grace? And were you able to adequately describe it later? I've been conscious of experiencing God's grace, and I've told the story like a million times, and not one single time have I ever told it adequately. There's a freedom to experiencing God's grace that defies even the captivity of words. It simply cannot be contained in all the words I know. The disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And that probably captures it as well as any words would, which is hardly at all. What they mean, probably, is something like, we looked at those scars and understood in that moment that the most terrifying, humiliating, powerful weapon of the empire had been rendered impotent by the love of God. Whether that's what they meant or not, that is what happened. Jesus shattered the illusion of power that the empire had worked and is working so hard to cultivate and sell. The many component parts of empire market fear to us in a thousand ways every single day. Fear that we're not enough. Fear that we do not deserve love or respect. Fear that we're doing life wrong. Fear that other people are trying to get our things or take our things or keep things from us. Fear that if we speak up or show up, we will be targeted. And when Jesus shows up, with the nail marks from the empire's violence on his hands and the rip in his side from where the fear and power lust of the world pierced his body with a spear. When he shows up unbroken by this broken world, wounds on display, and says, peace be with you, the illusion is shattered. Because there's no better revenge on death than life. The spell is broken, and at least for a moment, the disciples know that all of the fear in the world is swallowed up in God's love, and they are free, just truly free. They rejoice. But they are still in that room when Thomas gets back. Maybe that's why he doesn't believe their story, because as far as he can tell, having seen God, having had an experience of consciousness of God's grace incarnate, they are not discernibly different to when he left them. Beloveds, that is too often the world's experience of the church. We say, we have seen the Lord, but we are not discernibly different to when they left us. If you ever wonder why we work so hard to do life and faith and church differently, the answer is this story right here. If encountering the risen Christ changes nothing for us and in us, why would anyone believe God is alive? Or why would anyone care that God is alive? What good is a living God who plays dead? None. And Thomas refuses to pretend any different. He won't believe in a living God who plays dead. And I hope that we are all brave and bold and faithful enough to the risen Christ that we won't believe in a God who may as well be dead. Thomas insists on encountering the living Christ. And you know what? That's fabulous and faithful. Good for him. And the risen Savior shows up. My Lord and my God! Thomas responds. In the Greek, it's a profound profession of belonging. Thomas says, essentially, I belong to you. You are the one to whom I belong. He just says, um, that's what those words mean, my Lord and my God. What they communicate is, I belong to you, and you are the one to whom I belong. Remember last week when I talked about Dr. Um, Lorgia Garcia Pena's idea that community is the most effective form of rebellion? Thomas 
claims community with Christ. He rebels against the very rational impulse to hide, to try to keep himself safe. And instead, he claims community with Christ. And Jesus does him one better because he's Jesus. He reminds Thomas that the community is so much bigger than the two of them, or even all the men gathered in that room, or even all of them and all of the women disciples of Jesus, or even all of the people alive at that moment, or even all of the people who had ever been alive up to that moment. The community is also us, those who will come along long after Jesus has ascended. Those who will not have seen, but will have believed. Thomas knew, he understood, that we would need a witness to believe. So he became one. Thomas the rebel. (laughs) That's the last time Jesus showed up behind locked doors. Thomas and the other male disciples came out of hiding. They chose us over their own safety. I wonder where they learned that. The next time Jesus meets Thomas and the other disciples, it will be on the beach with a meal of fish and bread. The next time Jesus meets us, it will be in a meal gathered around this table community for the rebellion, and food for the journey. We need both, and we can find them here. So come, rebels, doubters, you who have rejoiced and you who have not. You belong here in this community where we believe. God, help our unbelief. Amen. I invite you to assume a posture for singing. starting to feel like I'm a little predictable because the last two Sundays, the hymn of the day has really like nailed the whole point of the sermon. I'm like, hmm. Spirit moves. Yeah, I'm going to say it's divine intervention and not predictability. All right. <clears throat> Either way, let us pray. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Your church cries out, O God, and you listen. 
as you drew near to the disciples, draw near to us this day. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith is renewed and we witness to your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your creation cries out, O God, and you listen. Nurture trees, crops, wildflowers, and all growing things. Guide farmers, gardeners, arborists, those in our property management, and all others who tend the soil and nurture plants into life. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your world cries out, O God, and you listen. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders to work for the well-being of communities and the dignity of every person that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your children cry out, O God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice, for an end to racism, ableism, homophobia, and all other oppression, and for a world where all are fed and safe. We pray for all who cry out in suffering or pain. We lift up Duke, Austin Stark, and all the folks affected by the Palisade Fire. Michelle, Jane, Carson, Marlene, Chelsea, Catherine, Jackie, Josh, Stephanie, Emma, Gladys, Pastor Tim and Susan, Terry, Sandy, Sarah, Rihanna, Joyce, Micah, Priscilla, Lindsay, the Skinner family, Mary and the Bus family, Lynette and the Balding family, Pat and the Murphy family, the Absher family, and the Chambers family. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your congregations cry out, O God, and you listen. Renew pastors, deacons, musicians, and other staff administrators and volunteers who facilitated Holy Week and Easter worship. Open our hearts to discern where God calls each of us to serve. God of grace, hear our prayer. Accept our gratitude, O God, for the lives of those who now rest in you. Grant us your peace amid our fears. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray and those for whom we are forgetting to pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Savior. Amen. The peace of the risen Christ be with you all. Also with you. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another and with those online. Peace be with you. All right, I invite you to be seated. Um, it's been a week, you know. Um, I was legitimately thinking before worship, how many weeks ago was Easter Sunday? <laughs> just the one, everybody, just the one. Um, so my story to share this morning um, is really for those of you who weren't here last Sunday, which is just to say to you, there were people here last Sunday um, that we had not ever seen before, and I'm so very grateful that we were able to offer a space for people to worship, and I promise you that they experienced the joy of the risen Christ if they wanted to. And um, that is due to your continued support of this congregation and the ministry that we do. 
Sometimes it feels like we're just barely keeping the doors open, and that can feel really discouraging, but you know what? The doors are open, and that's not nothing. Uh, so, that's right. Um, so, thank you for that. Also, um, Pastor Dan had a conversation. I think this is an okay story to share because I'm not going to give any details. But, um, you know, people find out we're pastors through a variety of different ways. So at drop-off the other day at Cora and Thorsten's school, um, somebody who's non-religious pulled him aside and was, like, asking him all kinds of questions about what it means to be Christian, et cetera, because this person's spouse is going through a master's program and has to study a religion. Um, and they just legitimately don't, no, you know, if you don't know, you don't know, and so um, she was like, I read this, is this real, like, what is this about, and so they got to have a really interesting conversation, and then um, questions about, like, okay, so how does the Christian Bible differ from the Quran, and, like, where do they diverge or converge, and that sort of thing, Um, and I just really appreciate that That person may not ever feel comfortable um, coming to a worship service, but they know that there is a place that they can ask these questions and get thoughtful and honest answers. Um, And that is because, if we can toot our own horns, you've called us as pastors, and we are um, happy and willing to do that. So, thanks. We're also going to collect our offering right now. Um, I'm going to, I would like you to um, consider making two different offerings, okay? One is your regular offering to this church. Please don't stop that. We need it. The second is um, Rusty and Marlene's son, Austin, who we prayed for in the prayers, um, lost everything in the Palisade fire. He lived in the building that um, the arson occurred in, and he legitimately got out with his phone, the pajamas he was wearing, and his dog. And that's it. Um, And so, thanks be to God, he has family that he can lean on, but many of us um, know that even with that support, I mean, he has no clothes. No shoes. He does now because Marlene and Rusty bought him some. But, you know, he doesn't have shoes. He doesn't have clothes. He doesn't have a different place that he's going to live. He doesn't have probably a phone charger. Like, just like all of the things that we take for granted every single day, he doesn't have. And his sister has made a GoFundMe on Facebook. But if there are any things that you um, could contribute to help him start to rebuild his life, buy dog food, buy... Um, I don't know, a new leash. He probably doesn't have a dog leash, you know? Like, just all of those kinds of things. Um, I know that it would be really grateful, that, um, that he would be grateful, and that Marlene and Rusty would be really grateful. So um, if you brought cash, put it there, um, or talk to Rusty and Marlene and find out how you can be of help. Um, he works at a rin- winery, so he probably has to wear, like, fancy clothes to work, um, and he's slender, So if you have any fancy clothes and you're slender, talk to them. Now let us pray. God of all creation, you have given us life, love, compassion, and hope. We offer the gifts of our very beings to your holy calling. Strengthen us through these gifts to be the arms of mercy and justice for the world. Amen. All right, this is God's table, and everyone is welcome. The body of Christ is gluten-free, and both juice and wine are available. The wine is red, the juice is white. We are going to gather around the, um, the railing up here, Can I tell you something? Um, I don't want you to come right here. It's really hard to get to you, and it's very hard for the kids um, to then, like, appropriately receive your things. So we are trying to kind of mark that by we left the kneelers in 
where, where it would be great for you to kneel. If there's not a kneeler there, look, I'm still going to commune you if you rebelliously come up here and kneel where there's not a kneeler. Whatever, I love rebels. But it would really help me out if you would um, avoid those spots. All right, thanks. Um, okay. I invite you to assume a posture of reverence. The risen Christ be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus claimed the world with your liberating love, bound us to one another and to you, and destroyed the lies of every other claim about us, leaving only beloved eternally. May the rising of your Son every day fill us with the courage to raise our voices, joining the women who bore witness to your resurrection at the tomb and the people who believed them, the earth and sea and all their creatures, angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, as together we proclaim your liberation and your love and praise your name. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Creator, our Mother, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you who are in the sanctuary, um, you are welcome to start making your way down to the railing as you sing the Lamb of God.
Let us pray. Radiant God, with our eyes we have seen your salvation, and in this meal we have feasted on your grace. May our word, may your word take flesh in us, that we may be your holy people, revealing your glory made known to us in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. All right, announcements. Um, the first one is one that you are well aware of, which is we are officially an RIC, Reconciling in Christ congregation. Woo! Um, we received our official notification as a Reconciling in Christ congregation last week, and we join over 1,000 congregations, synods, and other organizations in this holy ministry of welcome, inclusion, celebration, and advocacy. And can I just tell you that I feel a little sad every time I read that, over 1,000. That feels like such a small number, doesn't it? 1,000 in the whole country. There have to be 1,000 churches in Minnesota. <laughs> anyway, OK. My kids just took CMAS. Well, so apparently I'm thinking in terms of like, we're in the upper like 92% or whatever. Um, all right, beginning today, we will start studying together, meeting Jesus again for the first time. Um, it begins this week right after worship. And by right after worship, I mean like go get your snacks and things like that. Um, and then you'll all begin discussing chapter one. I will not participate in that in protest. No, just kidding. It's because I'm teaching Sunday school. Um, and so if you know any elementary-ish aged kids who would benefit from some schooling, you let me know. I would love to invite them and teach them in Sunday school. Um, Carlene has asked us to continue to remind folks that April Foods Day is coming. And so um, these empty shopping bags are available and you can return that, you, so the, on them is a, a piece of paper, it repre, um, it's from a different organization, there are a bunch of different organizations, I don't know how many, and it'll say on there which organization, and then it says some things that they're specifically looking for, so you can pick and choose what bag you want, and then you just fill the bag with the foods that are on it, or, I mean, if not, you can put other foods in there, and then return them to the church before April 27th, so let's say by April 26th. And then if you are around April 27th and would be willing to help deliver that food to the, um, Carlene, is it to the organizations? Like, do they need to go around to the different organizations or does it all go to one place? And then the organizations come and get it. I'm asking, maybe she'll post in the chat, but there is a bit of delay. Um, at any rate, if you don't want to wait or she doesn't post in the chat, you can con contact Carlene um, directly and she will help give you details. She won't be here to deliver them as usual because she'll be at Synod Assembly and so will your pastoral team and our children and also the chamber's adults um, because we are all going to represent you and please keep us in your prayer and the rest of the Synod we are um, electing a new bishop at this Synod Assembly and that has a big impact on the direction of the synod. And so we are asking for the Holy Spirit's guidance to um, lead us into the future to which God is calling us. Carlene says that the collection is at one downtown site, so you could just take all the bags to one place on April 27th. Fantastic. Um, I see that Kathy has an announcement. While you make your way up here, Kathy, I'll just say one more thing. I saw on Facebook that Rainbow Trail is looking for a camp nurse for the summer. So if you are a person who has nursing skills and you would be interested or you know someone who would be interested in being the camp nurse at Rainbow Trail, I guess talk to me. It does not have to be for the whole summer. So if you are or know of someone who can even help for a week or two, that would be much appreciated. Good morning. Good morning. So the weather is going to get better this week. So I'm not here to talk about the grass outside. 
Um, I'm here to talk about the coffee hour that we do at various places. It's always the second and fourth Wednesday of the month, and I think we need to change location now that we can get outside. So if there aren't any objections, I'm recommending that we go back to the Roots Gastro Hub at 401 Colorado Avenue. Um, there's a bike shop in the front. There's the coffee shop in the back. They have a really nice outdoor section. Um, our numbers vary. Sometimes we have four people. Sometimes we have 10 to 12. So we welcome new faces and those more experienced faces. Thanks. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, the second and fourth Wednesdays. So last week was one of the Wednesdays that you all met, right? I often go, but last week was Holy Week, so I think it was. I think it happened, but I wasn't there. Is that right, Kathy? Yeah. So then, don't there? We won't be. I mean, you're welcome to go this Wednesday, but the rest of us won't be there unless you invite us. Um, but next Wednesday, we will be. Um, it's actually pretty fun. Yeah. Go ahead, Gertrude. Oh, okay. So the people who are studying um, meeting Jesus again for the first time are going to be meeting in the library. Um, people who haven't been here for 25 years are like, the library? I didn't even know we had one of those. Surprise! Um, uh, let's go that way. Boop! Um, is that, that going to be available to folks who join online? Has anyone expressed any interest in that? Okay, so um, folks who are online right now, if you would like to join that study, either just to listen in or to participate digitally, um, please, more or less immediately, let Pastor Dan know so that he can make that happen. Unless someone lets him know, they will not set up the whole hybrid situation. So he is delighted to do it if you would like to join, but you need to let him know. Right now. Just kidding. I mean, you know finish going to the bathroom or whatever and then do it. Um, I thought I had another announcement, but I can't recall what it was. Oh, next, oh, can you get our daughter? Um, next Sunday is Cora's birthday, April 14th. Um, she is not like her brother. She likes a really big deal to be made about it. So if you can just put it in your calendar and remember to at least be like, Cora, happy birthday. She has been waiting and waiting for her birthday to be on a Sunday because she's so excited about like the church recognizing her. Hi, baby. Did you want to make your announcement? Okay. Um, I'm going to give you that microphone, but I'm going to take it down so you're holding it. Is that fine? Okay. And then come stand over here. Uh, probably. Here. Can you hold this? And then. Okay. So. So I'm doing Girls on the Run. And there's this thing called a run raiser at Girls on the Run. And, yeah. What is, wait, what's Girls on the Run? It's a thing every, after school, every Monday and Wednesday. And you're running for 40 or 30 minutes. And at the end of Girls on the Run, you're going to do a 5K. And also, do you have a lesson where you learn things? Yeah, we have a lesson, but it's not my favorite part. I don't think it's anyone's favorite part. What, what kind of things do you learn in the lesson? How to be kind and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, not the most interesting stuff. <laughs> Way to sell it, babe. Way to sell it. <laughs> um, so you probably have heard of Girls on the Run. It is a uh, it's an organization that is um, girl empowerment. And um, so, yeah, they, we get together Mondays and Wednesdays at her school, and there are a lot of different um, girls on the run, like chapters, I don't know, groups at the different schools. And um, the girls get together, they learn about things like um, your happy pace, which is um, to figure out how do you feel when things around you are moving too quickly? 
How do you feel when things around you are moving too slowly? How do you feel when things around you are moving at the pace that feels right for you? Um, and then how do you sort of like manage yourself so that you are moving at your happy pace both around the track and in life? Um, how do you be a star shiner? What is it? A star sparkler or something that like makes other people's star shine brighter? Um, and what do you do? Um, like wh what are some ways that if you are failing at something, like what's some self-talk you can do to help you stick with it, that kind of thing. Um, so Cora is here, um, not just to tell you about that, but to ask for money for the run, gotta say money for the run raiser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the run raiser. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do ha I have no, no idea what it's going for. It, it just goes to support the organization. It it's goes to support the organization and... And the 5K. And the 5K. Yeah. Um, so in May, we'll run a 5K together. And um, also, if you want to volunteer, you can. But so Cora has this donation sheet, um, and it says you can give online or in person if you would be interested in doing that. Um, she would be happy to talk with you after worship. Um, how much are you hoping to raise? Two hundred fifty dollars. Because there's a really you, nobody can hear you right now. Because love. there's a really cool thing if you raise two hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> she wants to raise two hundred fifty dollars. Yep. Mm -hmm. So far, she has whatever her parents are donating, <laughs> so which is know. not two hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> um, <laughs> please feel no pressure just because she is your pastor's child, but. Um, she is a regular member of our worshiping community, so I told her it was okay to make this announcement. Um, do you, is that all you want to say? Did you say please? Mm-hmm. No. Definitely not. No. Definitely not. Yeah, not yet. Never. See? Oh, growth mindset. Uh, I'm the fastest one there, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she says she will sit. Um, yeah, April is saying um, that girls on the run is really great. They really are. Um, husband, spouse, uh, April would like to listen in this morning, so if you could please set it up for hybrid, that would be lovely. Thank you. Okay, I believe that those are all of the announcements that I can think of. Oh, um, probably Cole would like this to be noted as well. Um, there are still people gathering every single Sunday afternoon um, to proclaim our desire for a ceasefire in um, Gaza. So if you would be interested in gathering with others to uh, draw attention to that uh, desire, you can talk with Cole and he will give you more information. All right. Now allow me to announce this blessing upon you. Oh, April, thank you. April says she will sign up for a donation. Oh, thanks. Just uh, text me, April, and then and let me know, and we'll front the money. May joy find you and raise you up to meet hope. May you become love and possess the courage to receive it. May you hold and be held allowing the vulnerable parts in you to find community for the journey. May God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit set you free and hold you fast. Amen. I invite you to join in singing.
Go in peace. Christ is with you.